Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rajiv Askhana from immigration.com, the law offices of Rajiv Askhana PC. We hold this community conference call every two weeks on Thursdays at 12.30, phone number 202-800-8394, 202-800-8394, 30 Eastern Standard Time. You would have heard the disclaimers when you dialed in. Those disclaimers apply. Let me just make sure that you can all hear me. The conference is now in conversation mode. Can you guys hear me okay? Am I audible? Yes, hi yes. Raji, we can hear you. Excellent, let's get started. The conference is now in presentation mode. So today I have not marked any of the posted questions as frequently asked questions. Um, I think we'll have time for uh, new questions at the end of the call, so we should be okay. I don't mind spending a few minutes extra today. I don't have any afternoon appointments. So we'll finish everybody's questions before we log off. The first one is um, naturalization eligibility for parents. So the problem here is parents were out of the United States for more than six months. They came back in November, more than six months later. But that's less than one year, right? That's good. They couldn't fly back because of COVID. Now, they would qualify for naturalization because the way the naturalization works is this. First, you must meet the five-year requirement unless you're married to a US, U.S. citizen, which is three years. So five years, you must have had a green card. And out of those five, well, not five years, but out of the immediate five years before you file the naturalization, you must have been physically present in the United States for at least 30 months, which is about two and a half years. And if you are outside the U.S. for more than six months, less than one year, you should have a good explanation for it. And I think your parents have an excellent explanation. It's COVID. Everybody was thrown off balance. So I don't think it's a problem applying for a naturalization for them as long as they meet the other requirements. Press star five if you have a new if you have a follow up question, no new questions please. Any follow up question on what I just discussed? There being none, let's go on to the next one. Next question was H one B drop box stamping issue. Maybe I should have marked this as a frequently asked question. First of all, folks, there's a difference between. Difference in principle, not in practice. There's a difference between being eligible for Dropbox and being eligible for a, an interview waiver. So in some ways, the interview waivers are a lot more permissive and the Dropbox option is a lot more restrictive. And in some ways, it's the other way around. So it depends upon the situation. In either case, the net result is the same. So I said it's different in principle, but the same in practice. Basically, you end up getting a visa stamp on your passport without having to actually appear for the interview. So interview waiver, H-1B Dropbox or Dropbox facility, these are two different things. Now, let's go back to the clarifications that have been asked in question number three. I'm planning to go for H-1B Dropbox stamping in India, planning to physically stay in India from March 1st to 30th. Clarifications. Legally, is it required for my employer to run the place pay slips irrespective of the scenario that I am working during the stay or in vacation leave? Okay, so coming to the bottom line of this question, if I'm outside the United States, is the employer required to pay me? And I can think of three scenarios here. I think I should mark it as a frequently asked question. I'm, I'll, I'll do it later. So the point here is this. When somebody is outside the United States on H-1B, if the leave is given for the convenience of the employee, it can be unpaid leave. They don't have to pay you. But if the leave is a routine part of your annual leave or standard benefits package, then the employer should be paying you. And if for some reason you are delayed in India because of, for example, visas, 
things are murky. There is one school of thought that says you must be paid. Another school of thought says, no, not really. I am of the school of thought that says you don't have to be paid. And there is a ruling by the Department of Labor, which I believe is a very poor ruling. And one of these days that's going to get knocked out. That ruling said, no, no, you have to be paid. But that was a very unique kind of set of circumstances. So bottom line, you don't have to be paid if it's for your convenience and not a part of your normal annual vacation. Second question, DS-160, who is my employer? Or whoever your employer is at the time of filing of your DS-160. What are the minimum required documents and optional documents? That's all listed on the um, consulate website. And remember, consulates in different countries have different flavors. I don't know off the top of my head what the requirements in India are, but they are listed on their website. Also, before you, when you do, for example, the Dropbox interview, uh, they, they have listed on their website all the requirements. Question number four, if I work for two different clients, same employer, is it okay to do that during stamping? Okay, so I understand this question to be this. I am in India. I'm working for two, two different clients to the same employer. Is it okay? I don't see why not. Well, first of all, India is your home country, I assume. You don't need work authorization to work in India. The USA should have nothing to say about that. So bottom line, can you work for two different clients? Absolutely, while you're in India. Last question. I have only one stamping, L1B, in 2011. I didn't get any other stamping. I uh, Could I know if I'm eligible for Dropbox? So remember, there are two different methodologies here. I mentioned that earlier. Dropbox and interview waiver announced a couple of weeks ago are two different things. Dropbox re requires that you are extending the same visa that you had your passport had had on your passport in your case you didn't have an h1b it doesn't look like from what i recall that it is a dropbox case it would be an interview waiver case and that only requires this number one you are applying from your home country number two you are applying for one of the visas that are listed as eligible for waiver they are all employment based and f1s and, and j1s okay number three you are applying from your country of nationality. Number four, you are, you've, you've had a visa stamp on your passport sometime, any visa, even a tourist visa. And number five, you've never been denied a visa. And if it was denied, you were able to overcome the denial. So those are the five requirements for an interview waiver. All this is on, on my blog. If you go to immigration.com, on the top panel, there's a link to my blog. Star five. If you have a follow-up question, press star 5. No new questions, folks. Follow up on what I just discussed. Okay. Oh, there is one. Let's see. This is from area code 646. 646, where are you calling from? Okay, I am calling from Florida. So, just a quick question I have. Uh, if somebody is traveling to India on H-1B for getting stamping done, mm -hmm. can he or she work from home for two weeks or three weeks? Absolutely. Why not? And can then get paid? Absolutely. Why not? Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Good luck. Okay. So next question is oh there's another one from new jersey all right let's answer that question guys be a little quick uh okay oh i don't know what happened you got dropped off uh you can press star five again if you still have a question all right there being none we'll go on to the next question question number four Best options for an F1 student, father is a U.S. citizen, waiting for I-539 approval to get a green card. I just arrived in the U.S. April 2017. You were an F1 doing your master's. You finished it. You applied for post-completion. You got it. Then you tried to get a STEM OPT extension. You received an RFE in March 2021. You received a denial notice in June, had to stop working. You took admission in another university in July. You filed a motion slash appeal. 
and reinstatement, got the notice to submit the biometrics, I've been waiting for progress. Future plan, my father is a US citizen and we are planning to file for my green card. So there are several complicated complicated issues here, Karanjit. Um, when would you recommend me to file the green card immediately or wait for these cases to get resolved? Here is my concern. I don't have the answers, but I can tell you what my concerns are. Concern number one, are you accruing unlawful presence since June? Okay. Somebody needs to look at your paperwork and give you a detailed consultation. Because unlawful presence means after 180 days, you become eligible to receive anything, green card, H-1B, anything uh, for three years. After 365 days of unlawful presence, one year, you become in ineligible for 10 years. So I would be very concerned that you have a 310 bar problem. You should talk to your DSO and figure out and also discuss with a lawyer what your situation is. I can only tell you what I can see from here. How long would it take to process the green card application? Well, <coughs> there may be a considerable waiting period and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, Google Visa Bulletin and look at the Visa Bulletin for the coming month, February or March. You'll have February on right now. And you see under India category for your um, family-based category, whatever that category is, um, it's probably several years. And you're not going to be considered legal to stay in the United States during those several years. Okay. How long would it take to process? I do not know. Can I apply for an EAD? No, you cannot. What are the chances of this EAD approval until the green card is pending? No chance. Because under the law, you can get your EAD only when the priority date becomes current and you file your I-485. In your category, the priority dates are probably backed up several years. Okay. So I can tell you what my concerns are. I can't tell you what the answers are. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. Okay, no new questions, folks. Just, we are going over the posted questions first. Then comes the next one, question number five. This is about interfiling. Priority date is 2012, filed I-485 downgrade from EB2 to EB3. Received EAD combo card. My st spouse started using green card e uh, EAD. I am still in H1B. Final action dates are current in EB2. So here are the questions. What happens to already using EAD and APs if I interfile back to EBT? I don't think that's a problem. Uh, in fact, the USCIS uh, connected with American Immigration Lawyers Association. And if you go to my blog on immigration.com, you'll see that I have posted the very first entry is on these issues. And one of the things that the government clarified was that we only care that you are legal. We don't care if you have H1, H4 or not. So I think you should be okay. I don't see any problem. Currently, EAD renewal is pending under EB3. No impact to um, of interfiling on that. I don't see it. Should I wait until EB3 final action dates become current? I would probably, it appears that EB2 dates are going to move faster. So I think filing for uh, back for an uh, EB2 connection of the 485 using that special address that the government has given us might be advantageous for you. Okay, so I'm recommending interfiling. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. Okay, let's see. This is from area code 408. I know that is California. So California, go ahead, please. What question do you have? Yeah, hey. yeah thank you, uh, Rajivji. Um, so uh, my question is related because of my daughter's situation. Mm -hmm. So currently we have an EB3-based uh, filing in place and it was current at that point in time. Mm -hmm. She will be turning 21 in this October. Mm -hmm. um, my <coughs> 2 date is not yet current, but it is very close. 
So my question is, and I was thinking of doing a fresh filing instead of... The yeah, case. I am thinking the same thing. I think that's a good idea. We don't want to disturb the, the EB. But, you know, actually, hang on. Let me think about this for a moment. When does she turn 21, did you say? October 2022. Okay. Um, what, what, what you might want to consider, talk to your lawyers, please. Here is another strategy. What you do is, you do your EB, are your dates for final action are not current right now, right? Is that what you said? No, but we are very close. Yeah. Okay. So what I would do is I would wait until the dates for final action are current. I'll wait another month or two. Correct. Once they become current, I would okay. interfile the EB3 to EB2. Okay. If that works out great, okay. otherwise what I would do is I would file a second 485 with the pending I-140. Remember, while the I-140 is pending, that period can be deducted from her age. So she's pretty safe, right, with the EB-3 also. Right. EB-3, she's covered right now. Well, I see that point also. Because what I was thinking was that when you filed her EB-3, the dates, dates for final action were current? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, in that case, I think you can file a new uh, 485. I think that's what makes sense. You're right. Okay. But just monitor it but carefully. Another, another... Yeah, just monitor it carefully. Yeah, sorry. Make another, sure another... You, you don't get approved before um, before she's covered under the EB-3. So you might at some point have to decide, okay, uh, the dates of final action did not become current before she turned 21. So we probably have to withdraw the EB-2 485. So keep that in mind, okay? The dates for final action must become current. Yes. Correct, correct. I will not file unless that becomes current. But I have another slight twist because she's also completing her college uh -huh. and probably is going to start, a, start her job. So if she utilizes her GCEAD, uh -huh. can we still do a fresh file or then only interfile will be current? Well, that's what, that's what the government said. I just, ex ex I just explained that that if you go to uh, my our website immigration.com and look at my blog the very first entry the most recent entry discusses this and in one of the questions that uscis made clear was we don't care for interfiling whether you are maintaining status or not we only care you are legal so that means um, as long as you have a 45 pending you are legal right so i don't think it should be a problem for, for interfile, it is okay, sir. But what about fresh filing? For fresh filing, does she have to be on a non-immigrant visa? Because then she would have been on a GCEAD. Right? When was when did her non-immigrant visa expire? Her status? No, she's still on an F1 right now. F1. So when, so when did... Start, hang on, hang on, hang on. Back up a little bit. Hang on. Has she used yeah. her EAD at all so far? Not, not yet. Not yet. So then she is still on F1. You can file her 485. What is the problem? No, but once if she uses her GCAD, then she will not be able to do it. Yeah, but by that time, you would have filed her 485, right? So I would say avoid the avoid the gray area. Although I don't think it's it should be a problem based okay. upon what the USCIS is saying. Wait until the dates are current. Tell, let her use the EAD after that, not before. Once you file her 485. Okay? I got to move on. All right. Good Thanks. luck. Mm -hmm. Area code 425. Where are you calling from? 425. Hi, I'm calling from Seattle. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, I got my EAD through my spouse, mm -hmm. uh, his EB3, mm -hmm. but his EB2 is still in progress and final action dates are not current, mm -hmm. but it is close to become current. Mm -hmm. But I have been working on my H1B. Mm -hmm. Now, I registered an LLC. Would mm -hmm. that mean that my EAD is activated? No, no, no. Just, okay. just so registering, or... just registering doesn't mean anything. Unless you start doing business, that's when you lose your H-1B. Okay. okay. So, if I registered and then, am I eligible to hire someone to work for my No, company? that's that's when it starts becoming problematic because now... You are actually doing business. Do not do that. Okay? 
Okay. Good luck. So for an EB3 EAD, I am eligible to work if I if I have an LLC. I am only I am eligible to work in my LLC. And no, I if hire anyone. only right? only thing that is stopping you is if you want to maintain your H1B. If you want to be on EAD, you can okay. do whatever you want. Okay. If you want okay, to. Okay. So will it affect um, anything on my husband status? No, not at all. Okay, so I will be like on EB EB three EAD, and I can uh, work for my LLC as well as hire. Is hire as many people as you like, and if you have enough people, you can hire me as your lawyer. So I'll come work for you. All right. Okay. Good luck. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next question. So the question is from Prasad Shankar, number six. Uh, U.S. student visa through French citizenship. I'm an Indian citizen. I have three years of experience as a software developer. I can change my nationality to French. Can I apply for F1 visa to do my master's in USA? Yeah, why not? Absolutely. Uh, you should not have any... the the fact that you have um, French citizenship would help you, of course, uh, but um, it doesn't stop you from applying for a student visa. So, yeah, absolutely, apply. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, press star 5. Okay. So, this is a little bit complicated. Uh, applying for EB1 while pursuing a PhD and considering living in Canada. I'm on F1 visa, fourth year of PhD, my boyfriend, I guess it's boyfriend, my boy BF is, or is it best friend? Uh, my boyfriend, <laughs> some of these abbreviations. My boyfriend is on H-1B visa. Uh, he's planning to move to Canada for work purpose for three years. He'll come back and file for EB-1. I am still not sure if I should move to Canada with him. Okay. Do you think working in Canada for three years and coming back and filing for EB-1 affects my case? I do not know what that means. So if you are on the phone, press star 5. That question doesn't make any sense to me in the context. Maybe it was clear to you, but it's not clear to me. Do you think working in Canada for three years and coming back here and filing for EP1 affects my case? I don't know what that means. But one thing is for sure, if you are thinking of EB1 and you have three years of research experience, that makes EB1B uh, possible for you if you get a research or teaching job in the United States when you come back. Can I take up a remote position here in the U.S. and be in Canada or travel frequently? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have, we have a client who just finished his green card. He worked for many years living in Canada. Uh, he had an H-1B uh, and his company, they are doing environmental um, planning. So when he came to in USA, he was paid on based upon his H-1B. Rest of the time, he lived in Canada and he was, of course, still getting paid the same amount. But he doesn't have to be in the United States. He was doing his work remotely as well as traveling after a month or two months for a few days. So, yeah, that can be done. Number three, what if I file for EB1 immediately after PhD? Is that acceptable before H1B? Sure. If you qualify, I remember EB1 comes in two different flavors, EB1A and EB1B. EB1As are not easy. They are a difficult get. They are reserved for the top 10% people in your profession. And EB1B requires only international recognition. You don't have to be internationally renowned. Okay. Um, I'm going to say star five if anybody has a follow-up question, but I don't think she's here. Okay. We'll go on to the next one. H-1B stamping and C-26 category of H-4 EAD while application is pending. I'm on H-1B in the U.S. with my husband and my daughter. Okay. On H-4. Question 1. My H-1B recently got renewed, but H-4 is still in progress at California Center. Processing time shows they're doing July 2021. My spouse has EAD dated March 29, 2022. God, this is, these are long fact patterns. Can you please make them shorter? So uh, I have limited amount of time. Uh, they have extended EAD for 180 days. But is that depends on my H4 status being pending? I have no clue what you're asking me, ma'am. Very confused. Okay, um, I guess you are here. No idea what you're saying. 
So let's see if we can understand this. Area code 520. Where are you calling from? And is, did you post this question? Yes, yes. Okay. Where I'm are you? Calling from Arizona. Arizona. Okay. So what are you saying? Uh, this is what I understand. You are on H1B. Your husband has an EAD through you, right? Right, through H4. Through H4, got it. So his EAD is dated till March 2022, this, this year. They have extended EAD for 180 days. They have, who is they? So remember this, sorry. Uh, due to the pandemic uh, processing, remember they have issued this new memo on... Oh, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's not a memo. What that is, is a settlement in a litigation. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. Where they said, I said this is not much benefit to anyone. But what they said was this, and I don't remember all the details. They're also on my blog, on immigration.com. They said that... If you file your EAD extension timely, you can continue working till 180 days or the time remaining on your I-94. Your husband's I-94, when does that expire? Um, March 29, So he can't work after March. That's why I said this is a nonsense settlement. This doesn't help anyone. Exactly, because whenever they do EAD renewal, like a yeah, EAD exactly. for H4 EAD, it's only valid till H4 exactly. expires. So exactly, exactly. Like, how does this kind of work? <laughs> That's the reason I said, why are, why are people celebrating? It's not helping anyone. Why is this a big deal? It can only help very limited category of people. Okay. For example, and this is something somebody brought up. I didn't think of it. I'm not that smart. Somebody brought this up for my attention. They said, you know what? What if I... I, ha I go to um, Canada and get a visa stamp and come back. Yeah. Okay. Now my H4 is yeah. valid for, let's say, one year or two years. Now when I apply for EAD extension, I can work 180 days. And I said, yes, I agree. Right. We thought about that. But uh, like while uh, this uh, H4 status is pending over here, because now it's in July, and we are expecting to to come like in maybe June or July of this year. Mm -hmm. So if let's say we plan to go to Canada or even Mexico is very close, um, and we apply like I have my H one with me. So if I do for my family and we got stamped, then now he has I ninety four updated for three years mostly. But when the H4 is coming over here, can we still go? For yes. Something? Yes. The only disadvantage is if you leave the country, as your H4 extension is pending. Yeah, you can go. No problem. When you come back, just withdraw the H4. Okay. Uh, you have not. Have you filed the EAD already or not? Yes, we did. Uh, okay. November 2021. So, so what we you do is yeah, you withdraw the H4, H4 EAD both. And coming back, apply for H H uh, apply for EAD only, okay. As long as you apply for the extension before March 29th, you will get the benefit of being able to work for 180 days. You see my point? So when you oh, come back, um, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. only if we go before but, March But here, here, is, go here is another idea. What if you, and this is not tested, but I think it should work. What if you don't withdraw anything because you're allowed to travel when the H4 is still, extension is pending? So let's say you travel, okay. you go get the visa and come back. Okay. Um, can you then start working because your I-94 is now valid for more than 180 days? That answer I do not know. It certainly appears to be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't have a good answer for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so if you say we don't want to withdraw and we still travel before March 29, then and keep the EAD open, will that be okay? Like, That's I don't know the answer to that. I certainly hope so. Okay. 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 
Then your right. question number okay. two is, when I came to the US in 2016, I have an H-1B visa stamp till 2019. This is my second renewal. I'm eligible for COVID drop box in India. Okay, can I just send my documents to India? People are doing it. Consulates know that people are doing it. I don't know if they have ever okayed this practice. You can certainly email the consulate, ask them if that's okay. Okay, oh. so can we go to Nogales? Sure, if Nogales is taking third country nationals, you can go to Nogales. Okay. Do you, like, is there any risk of not going to our home country and going somewhere else? I have never been there, but no. do you think? No, there is, there is, there is, there is no reason for there to be risk. What happens is every consulate in the world has access to the same data. It used to be a problem earlier, but now everything is stored in a database called PIMS. That PIMS is accessible to all the consulates in the world. Okay. Okay. The data is on the cloud. Okay. I've got to go on, ma'am. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Uh, area code 646. 646, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, hi Rajiv, thank you so much uh, for answering my questions. I have follow-up question on this. Mm -hmm. So similar situation, I do understand that uh, before expiration of my EAD, mm -hmm. and when I'm seeking that my H4 extension, and H4 EAD extension is filed, but it's pending with Vermont. Mm -hmm. So uh, say I travel in March, and mm -hmm. I come back um, on I-94, and then we file my EAD. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But is it important to revoke uh, my previous filing, or it's, withdraw my previous filing, or it's okay, it's automatically get null and void. I think you should revoke it. You should actually, I don't think it gets automatically null and void because if you look at the H4EAD regulations when they first came out, government actually clarified saying that you can travel when the H4 extension is pending and the EAD is pending. As long as you have, you have a visa stamp, you can come back. Okay. So it doesn't look okay, like so, traveling so is a problem and therefore having two applications could be a problem. You can discuss it with the USCIS uh, customer service. They'll typically forward you to a level two officer who is an adjudications officer. Doesn't hurt to check with them. I think it should be okay, but it should be withdrawn when you come back. That's my feeling. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Raji, one more thing. Like, say if I go to India and my Vermont Center EAD gets approved and mm -hmm. I receive card over here, mm -hmm. so then after coming back, in that mm -hmm. case, can I work on that? Why not? EAD or Why not? Why not? Why not? It should be fine. Okay. Okay. And um, sorry, Raji, to take your time, but one more. Question. I have a lot of people waiting. I'm going to give you five more seconds and I'm done. Go ahead. Um, I'll try to add. So my uh, husband's employer, he had filed my export extension and EAD extension, but um, my husband switched to job. So his job with a new company would be starting in uh, like 20 days. And that company also has filed my H4 and H4 EAD extension. That's right. So if, when my company jo goes to a company, when my husband moves to company B, and I receive my EAD through previous employers. That's okay. Is that legal to work yeah, on that? That's case? okay. Normally what happens in these cases when the old employer revokes the H1, government throws out the H4 and the EAD as well. Okay? So, yeah, no. But employer is saying they will not uh, revoke Yeah, if they don't the revoke it, My only question you is can that. use whichever one comes first. It is perfectly legal to do so. Okay? Good luck. Okay, thank you so much. Guys. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. So, I guess we have one more question. Area code 206. Uh, 206, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Portland, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And my question is, yeah, and my question is I'm working with my employer on SMB, and uh, I filed layers uh, in EB3. Okay, hang on one second. And, Your uh, question has nothing to do with what I'm discussing yeah. right now. So wait till the end of the call. I'll take new questions then. Okay. Okay. So... Next question, number nine is, is it possible to apply for H1, H4 before marriage? I don't think so. And I think you can't fill out DS-160 stating that you are married when you are not yet married. That's my feeling. You can check with the consulate, but I don't believe you can file the, even the DS-160 before getting married, as far as I know. So my advice, check, check with the consulate. 
let's see is it okay to schedule for a future date you can you can definitely uh, file for a future date but the problem is how do you say you are married when you are not that's my problem i do not know the answer to this question i frankly the question number 2 i would ask the consulate that way you have a paper record of having inquired and received an answer they usually do respond yeah i do not know what the solution is the right thing to do is to call the consulate uh, please don't ask me any new questions only follow up questions on what we are discussing area code 801 where are you calling from Hi Rajesh, I'm calling from Salt Lake City, Utah. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I have posted this question, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, we did reach out to the consulate uh, right. via email. They right. asked us to reach out uh, uh, via call. Okay. So my fiance has called them from India, and they have uh, the customer care representative has told her that uh, we can go ahead and submit our DS one sixty and book the appointment. Okay, do me one favor. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Do me one favor. uh tell your tell your fiance to write down the date and the time of the call and what the customer service representative said and if she can remember who she talked with okay that way nobody can come back and say you are committing any kind of fraud okay all right Fine, like just to uh, jot down the time and date and name of the person. Uh, yeah. Need anything in the writing? No, 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 no. No, that's okay because even under federal ev rules of evidence, uh, this is considered to be evidence. If you do um, a record, contemporaneous record, as soon as you talked and you made a record, uh, you you are doing it a day or two later is not a big deal. But write it down what they said, and that way at least you are protected to a large extent. Okay. Okay. So what I have said to her is like uh, to the same email ID for the uh, for the Hyderabad consulate. Uh, we can just quote whatever the uh, customer care has said and just confirm by our email. Doesn't hurt. So no, uh, that is also that is also a, a way to do it. If you don't get and get get a, just in that email, put down that on this date we had called and this is what we were being told, and then keep a copy of that email. In that way, that's a record yeah, that you yeah, try to yeah. clarify the record. Okay, so I think I think then it's okay to take that risk. Yeah. Let me know how it works out. It's it's really weird what these guys do. Let me know how it works out. It'll be good for other people to know yeah. also. Okay, you have my email ID. Yeah, my yeah. email is my email is help at immigration dot com. Drop me an email. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sir. Bye bye. Next question number ten: um, Can an H four visa holder work from home in the U S. for Indian based company get salary in India? I don't think that's legal, but I could be wrong. Okay, because there really is no hard and fast statement from the U S. C I S. on this issue. So, in my view, this is not possible. I think it's a violation of H four. Star five. If you have a follow up question. Oh, by the way, once she get her EAD approval, she can do whatever she wants. And then there is no problem. Area code eight zero one. Yeah. Again. What is it? Bye again. Uh, yeah. She is a consultant psychologist in India. So can she continue like taking her clients in India? I don't think so. I I think it's a violation. But what do I know? All I can tell you is what I can think from common sense. There is no law that I know of. Okay. I gotta go on. Good luck. Yeah. Be quick, guys. Be quick. You are young people. I'm an old guy. I still move quick. All right. So next question number eleven, which is the last post? No, second last posted question. Then we'll do our new phone, uh, new questions after that. So. Eleven, Radhikesh says, "I came to USA 2014. I've already used my three years of OPT. I'm working for a non-profit on a cap exempt H-1B. 
if a profit organization file for my H1B, when can I start working? Can I start working based upon the receipt? My best guess, oh, no, hang on. No, this one is actually easy. You cannot start working until your H1B is approved because, well, wow, that's not an easy question to answer. There's a conflict of two or three different regulations. Here is what I would do if I were you. I would either have your employer, their lawyer, or yourself call the USCIS customer service. Ask this question of a level two officer. Make a note of the date, time, and the name of the officer. The officer that you speak with will either give you their uh, number, ID number, or they'll give you their first name. Write it down. If they say you can start working with the receipt, go for it. Because there are two comp two conflicting ideas here. One is CAP doesn't open till past October 1st and you are on a non-CAP H-1B so you should not be allowed to work until the CAP season approaches. Uh, but can you still work on a receipt even after the CAP approaches? I do not know the answer to that question. There is no uh, specific statement made by the USCIS in this regard that I know of. So in an issue like this, I would rather have it resolved from the USCIS customer service, okay? That's, well, are there any other visa options? Yeah, there is a very good visa option. What you can do is, you can file concurrent H-1B. So you can, while you are working for a non-profit, also work for a for-profit concurrently as long as you keep both jobs. At the same time, start your lottery case. And when that comes on, you can then jump ship completely and leave the nonprofit. So there's a little weird loophole in the law which allows people on nonprofit H1Bs to work for for profit companies simultaneously. Star 5, if you have a follow up question on this, Star 5. Okay, the last posted question filing concurrent H1B from Inder. I work for employer A full-time under H-1B 40 hours. If B files for me H-1B currently, then files my perm, can I file adjustment from B? Uh, yes, you can, but only requirement is that the job that you get once you get your green card should be full-time. So even though while you are working there uh, on a concurrent H-1B, you are working less than 35 hours, but when the green card is approved, you must get a job 35 hours each week or more. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, press star 5. Okay, guys, anybody has any question, press star 5. Let's see how many we have. Okay, we have six questions, seven so far. All right. Are you guys sure? Nobody else has a question? Eight. 100% sure? Are we done with eight then? Okay, very good. I'm going to start in the order I see everybody come up before me. Area code 747. Where are you calling from, 747? Uh, hi, uh, I'm calling from Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I'm on my STEM OPT extension. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know if I can work for two different employers at the same time. Uh, it is possible, but you have to talk to your school. Um, I think there is some shenanigans uh, they need yes, to do. I, yeah. Yes, I talked to my school and they told me to submit uh, two different I-9-8. Right, from two different exactly, employers. exactly. And if they are okay with it, can I go ahead and work with two different employers? Yes, sir, you can. Okay. And after that, can both of them file H-1 for me? If they are completely unrelated and there are no common projects or common officers, yes. absolutely. Yes, sir, they can. Nothing in common. Yep, and go for if, it. If the H1 is picked and approved, can I continue to work with both the employers? Or only if you get, a, only once you get H1B approved through one employer, you can file then a concurrent H1B for the second employer. Okay. Oh, so can I have two H1s uh, yeah. concurrently? Yeah, I had a I had a um, a client who had three full time H1Bs. He was a um, database troubleshooter. So three companies paid him to just carry three pagers full time. He had three H1Bs concurrent H1Bs. Okay. 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 Are yeah, we, thank you. 
Good. Good luck. Okay. Area code 732. I know this is New Jersey. Or no, it's 216. No, 216 is done. Sorry. 732 New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Maybe I didn't select it. Uh, 732, can you hear me? Damn. Something is wrong. Um, let me just make sure I'm doing this right. I could be screwed. Can you hear me now? Uh, no, who is this? Seven, is this 732? Yeah, I can hear you. Is this 732? Hello? Yes, yes, it's 732. Oh, okay, good. Now? Yeah, so yeah. I, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Yeah. So, quick question is, so I have, um, or I rather had a 60 denial on my visa, and then I overcame it with a waiver. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, how does that affect my future green card applications, and what other things do I need to keep in mind going forward? What kind of denial again? Tell me. It's a 6C. I had gotten like a 6C misrepresentation thing, which I overcame with a waiver um, for my current H-1B. Um, okay. But then for my for my future statuses, what are my options for green cards and uh, change of status and all of those things? And what things I do would, I keep in mind? I cannot answer that question in the abstract. Okay. So typically what happens is when you, when you have a 212-A6C, uh, denial based upon fraud or misrepresentation, that's a permanent bar from entering the U.S. Okay. Did you use a 212-D3 waiver? Yes, that's right. Yeah, 212-D3 waiver does not waive away your underlying uh, misrepresentation. But the fact that you received the 212-D3 waiver gives me some pause. Why would they give it to you if your, if your um, violation was that serious? So I do not know the answer to that question. <clears throat> it's certainly something you need to be aware of. Um, to answer your question, will it, will it become a problem for the green card? It may or may not, depending upon the facts of your case. The fact that you've got a waiver doesn't absolve you from ongoing consequences as far as I know. Okay? Correct. But for each time when I go for, like applying for, let's say, a for a green card application or something, mm -hmm. it's fine because I have all the facts and everything and I got the waiver. So the waiver, the, the waiver, the, the waiver is not, the waiver is not absolution. The waiver is not forgiveness. The waiver merely says, um, you have a bar, you have a permanent bar, but we'll let you go for three years. Okay. Not sure how you got the waiver because typically they don't give 212D3 waivers on these kind of cases. So that makes me hopeful that maybe something, there's something in your case that bears some special uh, attention. But abstractly, can it affect your green card? It may and it should. Uh, is there any way out of that? I do not know because I don't know the whole case. So the lawyer who give, did the 212D3 waiver is the lawyer you want to talk to. All right. Good luck. I I went to the I went to the consulate myself. Okay. Actually, then you need at this point you need so talk to your wasn't any lawyer talk anymore. to your green card lawyers. I can't do anything more than that right now. All right. Good luck. Okay. Area code two zero two nine zero nine. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, this is two zero two. Uh, area code is DC, but I'm calling from Minneapolis. This question on uh, I have a DC EAD. Okay. Uh, that. I have received. So uh, the filing is from um, EB2 to EB3 downgrade, which we filed in October 2012, um, mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, the question around that is, um, since it's uh, stuck at tax or service center, it might take forever. So I'm thinking whether with the same employer or with the new employer, can I do a new 140 and then file an EB2, a brand new Oh, hang on, hang on. Before yeah, you go yeah. any further, hang on. You don't ever file a direct I-140 unless you qualify for a national interest waiver, EB-1A, EB-1B, EB-1C. So if you are a regular PERM oh, case... Sorry, yes, my employer. Sorry? Sorry, it, it will be through my employer, not me though. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. It doesn't matter. You have to go through the PERM process all over again. You don't just file the I-140. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah, so we'll go through the firm process, advertisement firm process, mm-hmm. 140, mm-hmm. and then can we do a new AOS with a new, uh, yes. brand new EB2, Absolutely. although this one is pending. I do that all the time. I file multiple all the time. Yeah. Yes, sir, you can. All right. Okay, I can, we can do it with the same employer, right? If we wanted to. With the same employer, two 485s, I do them, but I make sure that yeah. there's an explanation why I'm doing that. Uh, if not, we have to do with the new employer, right? No, you can do it with the same employer. I have two, I have two 485s when there is an EB2 and EB3 going on. Sometimes I file two for the same employer. I just make sure that I give an explanation and I have the same A number on both. Okay. Right. So just a quick follow up on that too. So uh, if a new employer is willing to do my uh, new firm, new 140, new EB2 AOS, do I have to transfer my H1 to them or should I be on That's H1? a very long discussion. I, I won't be able to take that right now. Uh, the answer is theoretically it is possible. Hang on. Theoretically it is possible. You need to talk to a lawyer in detail about the consequences. It certainly is possible. All right? Absolutely. Good luck. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll set up some time. Sure. Sure. Area code 408, California. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Rajuji. Thanks for taking the call. My pleasure. Uh, actually, you know, so the previous caller was asking about the refile, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to follow up on that because it sure. was an interesting idea. Can I do the second AOS using the same existing EB3? Because, you know, even my downgrade is struck at the Nebraska Service Center. Okay. And, you know, so, uh, so hang on. H- hang on. Things, you know, hang on. My employer one one second. The EB2. Sir, yeah, yeah. one second. So you had an EB2 approval from an employer. You filed EB3 downgrade. Can you now use uh, the same I-140 again? And the answer is if the um, I-140 you filed was an amendment and not a new, uh, I'm sorry, a new I-140, not an amendment. Yeah. You can use that I-140, the old one, and either file a new 485 or you can, if the dates are current, you can transfer interfile your pending 485 over to the EB2. Uh, we are for some cases yeah, but my employer is not supporting that's the problem. Well my what does the employer what does the employer have to do with it? Hang on you can pay for your own 485. What does the employer have to do with it? Uh, 485J uh, yeah, anything, any, uh, they don't have to if they don't have to if they don't have to if they don't have to pay for it why would they have a problem supporting it? Oh, it's a corporate policy, they say, and you know, so they are not supporting. It. Well, then you it's can't, a, you can't do it. You can't, and, you, know, you can't do it without their help. No. Yeah, that's why. That's why my question, you know, right? Instead of going to UB two, if I say, okay, sub, uh, submit another invoice using the existing UB three itself, can we do? You know, so because you made some comment, you know, to the earlier call. Mm, I don't see the point in it. I'm not sure it's illegal, but I don't think it's helpful. Oh, you know, there is a point that if I do only the non-concurrent, right, you know, I'm ex- my file is expected to go to NB. That's the main target, you know, for my second OS. I don't think That's that. Target I, I think I they'll just it. return your 485. You can try. It's not illegal, but okay. I think okay. they'll just return okay. They'll just return your yeah. 485. Okay. Good luck. Okay, okay. So, I, I, if, if, if you're okay, I, I would go with the, my original question, right? You know, so, you know, I was following up on earlier one, but I, I have other question, you know, right? I'm going to give you five more seconds. I've got to go. So, make it quick. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. My wife, you know, if, if she if she is on her own H1, and, but derivative in my OS, if she uses AP to come back to US, can she still continue on her own H1, or do we have to do any appointment or anything? Uh, and once she comes back to you. Okay, the answer is, we know the answer if she was the primary. So let's change the example. Let's say you had the H1 and you are working for that employer uh-huh. and you traveled and returned on advance uh-huh. parole. If you take up the same H1B job that you left uh-huh. on, you will be considered still to be on H1B. Uh-huh. Now, using that principle, Correct. I think the same should apply to the derivative. Okay, I got to go. Chicken Area code 214. Go ahead, please. Where are you calling from? 
I'm calling from Dallas. Yes, sir. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to know if I'm going to file H one B through two different employers, one with my current and another a future potential employer. Mm-hmm. So if uh, my H one B gets approved through my current employer, mm-hmm. how long minimum should I work with him on the? Uh, assuming that he is a cap exempt employer. After the H-1B status uh, comes into effect, how long minimum should I work before I apply for a transfer? Mm, if it is past October first, you don't even have to work one day. You can leave right right when after you get the approval, and October first comes and goes. So um, maybe two weeks, one week, just to be safe. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so uh, like. I have one. I'm on my stem OPT, and I have one more, uh, like two more items for my H one B lottery. Mm-hmm. So if I don't get my H one B pick, so I have two options. Like one, leaving the U S. And like if, if I leave the U S, can any employer in U S file for my H one B? Sure. Like, can I? Yes. Yes. In the uh, M S quota then. Quota, yeah, you can. If you finish your master's degree, okay, cool. even if you're outside the USA, an employer can apply for you, and they can do it under master's degree. All right. Okay. Good luck, yeah. sir. If I if I if I pursue a new degree, like second master's or PhD, then will my previous master's be overridden? No. So that I no be no. Up like, you can you can still go, go under master's degree quota. Once once the degree is earned, it is it is not destroyed. No problem. All right. So okay. while if while if I start my PhD and while I'm doing it and I get my H one B, then it it, it, it can be it can be right? it can I be. I can just continue my PhD. Yes, sir. you can. Thank, thank All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Area code two zero six. Where are you calling from? Um, I'm calling from Portland, sir. Um, mm-hmm. So I had a question earlier, but it's uh, to the last. So um, my question is like, uh, I got my uh, I want for this approved in both EB2 and EB3, uh, like uh, back in June, mm-hmm. and my employer filed uh, a was uh, for EB3 in August because that time it was current, mm-hmm. and um, I again filed my EB2. Um, a was in December, mm-hmm. and I got my EAD through EBC mm-hmm. uh, category. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, uh, can I use that uh, EAD um, to continue with my current project um, and uh, just uh, you know di- directly work on W two? Okay. Um, and uh, which that means that after my EB two. Um, okay. Problems. Well, here, there are several different problems here. Okay. First of all, um, the most important problem is this: if you want to change employers, wait until 180 days have passed from December. So in June, you can change employers and use AC21. That way, your rights are well protected under EB2. Okay. Sir, you filed your 485 under EB2 in December, correct? Okay, I've lost you. Area code nine zero eight, New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Ben Kitchen. Thank mm-hmm. you for taking call, sir. Mm-hmm. Sir, I have a like question on like okay, what happens to myself in H one B? My wife have H one H four sir actually. It's a valid visa until May thirty first. Mm-hmm. Okay, and she is currently in H four EAD and uh, she is doing the job there. Recently, what happened? We filed the H one B in premium and H four extension. My my company filed it only, <coughs> okay. not H four EAD. Mm-hmm. We filed it and we I got the approval, but still the H four is pending. Then mm-hmm. what I did is I I stand alone I filed it for H four EAD for renewal sir. Okay. Now what happened? We have to go to May month to the India sir. This is due to some urgency. Mm-hmm. So okay, what is the like? Okay, what will happen for H four E H four EAD application? I got to know that H four gonna be abandoned. But what will happen to H four EAD application if you mm-hmm. go and in India? Okay, so this is what I understand. Your wife has filed H four extension, right? Ah, uh, yes, sir. That's correct, sir. Okay, so to the best of and, my knowledge, and, she, and, and yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Please. Go ahead, finish. And she filed H four EAD extension also, sir. Okay, I mean, got, that. Last, got that. Got that. I got that. Okay, so yeah. as far as I know. Government allows you to 
travel when extension is pending as long as you have a visa to come back. Okay. So, if she travels, her H4 is not abandoned as long as she has a visa to come back. Double check this because if she had already an existing visa <clears throat> and she traveled and came back while the H4 extension was pending, there is zero doubt that her EAD would be safe. But if her current status is expiring and she is leaving and she comes back on a visa procured afterwards, does that work? I think it should. I think her EAD should be safe. But this commentary about how this works is in the Federal Register comments from the USCIS when they originally passed the H4 EAD regulations. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's worth looking into. It may be safe. You have a lot of noise from your side. I'm going to have to go on. Okay, good luck. Uh, Area code 206, go ahead, please. Yeah, guys, make sure you're on a, in a quiet, sorry, area code 801, go ahead, please. Make sure you're in a quiet environment. I can barely hear Hi, you. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, 801. Where are you I, calling from? Uh, on, the, on the follow up question, uh, I'm calling from Salt Lake City. Uh, on the follow up question where you have asked me to uh, mm -hmm. call the consulate. Right. Uh, if, if, uh, since the, since they have told me to go ahead and submit the application, mm -hmm. um, would that be okay or uh, would that be recorded? Would the call need to be recorded or something? No, call doesn't need to be recorded. But I thought you had told me you were going to send an email. Why are we revisiting this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm planning to send an email too, but okay. uh, there has been so, a problem there. Now. Uh, people have also to use a different DS-160 uh, or wait to submit the DS-160 till the appointment has been booked or, or before one month of the appointment. I'm not sure what you are saying. Uh, have you received conflicting so, information? Uh, Hang on. Have you re received conflicting information from the consulate? No, no, no. I don't care what people are saying. I, I don't care what people are saying. You do what the consulate tells you. The consulate told you, you can submit it, put an explanation, do that and confirm that in an email, okay? Even if they don't respond, I think you can do a DS-160 relatively safely at that point of time. All right? Okay, sir. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Area code 908, New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Hi, sir. Um, I'm sorry, the same question, sir. H4 EAD, you answer me. I'm sorry for that. It's not for my and my, actually. I mean, uh, like, uh, sorry for that, sir. Could you please help me, sir? Okay. What is sir, the question? H4, sir. H4, H4 valid visa with until May 31st, sir. Mm -hmm. We are planning to travel on May 1st and we are coming back to, like, okay, uh, May 31st. Then there is no problem. That, so, that H4 and H4 EAD are both safe. No problem. No problem, sir. No problem at all. Because that, that they made clear. They said your for it your EAD might get delayed. I think that's nonsense. I don't I don't think it does. Uh, but you can travel during the life of your visa even when the H4H4 H4 EAD is pending, no question. That's quite clear. No. Okay. okay. I cannot really give you two more questions time. No, 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 no. Sorry. Okay. I gotta go on. You should post your questions on the forums. Okay, so next question, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I put somebody down. Let's see, uh, area code 216, go ahead, please. You're back again. What's up? 216? Hello, this is from area code 216. Yes, sir. What's up? I have a quick question. Uh, employer B, I'm concurrent with them, and during I-40 filing stage, does that mean I have to... I have to be on the full-time payroll for 40 hours, not 35. So that means an H1 amendment. Is that the right statement? Mm, ask me again. I don't understand that question. So with employer B, I am on a concurrent. I'm mm -hmm. concurrent with him. And mm -hmm. employer A is my full-time 40 hours. Employer B is 35 hours or less. Mm -hmm. So with employer B, uh, during 45 filing stage, mm -hmm. do I have to undergo through H1 amendment? No, 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 not at all, not at all. So the difference here is 
H-1B is for the present job, what you are doing right now. Green card is a future job. So you have to have a commitment from the employer and from your side that you would work with them upon approval of the green card uh, full time. And full time means at least 30 hours, 35 hours each week. So, okay, so right now, tell... right now what you do is irrelevant. But there should be a clear commitment on both sides to employ you full time upon approval of the green card. Yes, I, I would be a full time so employer A forty hours and full time, employer B thirty five hours or less than full time. So so there shouldn't be any problem if a file adjustment of status from employee B. Okay, I'm gonna say this one more time and then I'm done. Okay? Because I've repeated like five times already. I won't repeat it again. You can listen to the recording and then you'll be clear. When your green card okay. gets approved, you've got to work for the employer B full time. Full time means 35 hours at least. What you do with employer A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, we don't care. The green card sponsoring employer must have you full time. Okay, clear? Clear, thank you sir. You're welcome, good luck. All right, folks, we are done for today. Uh, that wasn't too bad. We'll talk again. The best way to get answers is to post. And please don't post lengthy answer questions where it's difficult for me to parse through. Precise questions, precise answers. And also, uh, if we have time remaining, only then we answer uh, further questions. And I try to do it within an hour as much as possible. So we were able to answer most of the questions. I know there's one or two left, but there's not much I can do about that. Good luck to all of you folks, and I'll see you again in two weeks. Bye-bye.